Hey everyone, Stephanie Lucretio coming to you live. I'm super excited to be here tonight and to have such an amazing guest. For those of you that were in Trenton last week, you know that we had some amazing speakers. And what I loved most about the event that we had last week is we really spoke to every aspect of religious and medical freedom. We had attorneys, we had people that were nurses in the, you know, in the hospitals during COVID, we had religious leaders. So it was a great mix of everything. And we heard from parents, we heard from all different types of people. And the beautiful thing about what we did in Trenton last week was not only did we grow our community, because it's clear by the show of hands when I asked how many people are there for the first time, that this issue has so many people's attention right now. And I thought it was such a great time to continue the conversation because for many people, the feedback that I got was one of the speakers that spoke towards the end of the day, they would have loved to be able to hear more from, from and they also, many people had unfortunately had to leave and were watching it on live stream. So I wanted to bring back a really special guest, someone that I truly connected with and I was honored to have there. Rabbi David Smith became a rabbi to learn and teach the truth. And then he became a lawyer to help others speak the truth. He studied biology, virology, and infectious disease at the University of California at Berkeley, and he knows the truth. You may have heard of him as the lawyer for Dr. Yosef Glassman, who is fighting to stop euthanasia in New Jersey, and you may have seen his letter showing the false information that, you, that was used by public health officials to bully, rab, to bully rabbis into closing synagogues and yeshivas. Um, it was something that was shared widespread. So if you haven't seen it, I can certainly get a copy. But we are so honored tonight. I am so honored tonight to have Rabbi David Smith here with me tonight. Thank you so, so much for being here, for being willing to continue such an important conversation. Um, you really touched the hearts of so many people last week in Trenton. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for being here. I definitely felt that I touched so many people's hearts. And it was very moving to see that, to see people's responses, their enthusiasm. And uh, it's just been very, very, very moving. The whole, the whole experience, really incredible. Was that your first time in Trenton? Um, no, I was okay. in Trenton uh, before I had given a press conference, actually. Um, when we first went to court and we obtained a, a temporary restraining order against the physician assisted suicide law. Oh, and wow. We, we wanted to prevent people from being uh, terminated, their lives being terminated and poisoned by their doctors. And so there's a, actually an hour long uh, video of that, of that press conference available on YouTube. Oh, good to know. Okay, we'll have to definitely get that to people towards the end of the, um, the broadcast. Maybe you can send it to me and I can share it with everyone in the live feed because I'm sure people would love to see that. Okay. So mm -hmm. I wanna dive right into this conversation because there was, I watched it back today and I read your letter again today. And there are so many things that you talked about that really struck a chord with me. And one of the things that really got me when you were speaking last week was this whole issue of the government classifying people as essential and non-essential. And we've seen this since March. You know, you're able to work because you're essential, but you know you're not essential. So you have to stay home and collect unemployment and good luck paying your bills. So there's been this separation of the haves and the have nots, so it's called. And you really dived into that the other day. Can you talk a little bit about why this classification concerns you? Well, let's take it on two levels. One is let's start at the, the front level of the fact that a person who's defined as not essential actually does not have the opportunity to make a living. Yes. He's told or she is told they cannot make a living. And in God's world, anyone who's working to make a living is going to do essential work. And providing an income for one's family, putting food on the table is part of God's uh, vision for the world and what we're meant to be doing. So that right there is something that's completely unacceptable and there's no justification for it whatsoever now if we want to dig deeper into it we'll understand that this is really as i explained in the talk and also in the letter this is the definition that the nazis used to decide whose lives were unworthy of life and whose lives were worthy of life and those people who were able to be productive and to work and hard workers were the people that in the selection process and the death camps, they were told they were essential to the process and they were not essential. Um, the non-essential people were eliminated immediately. Now, this goes back to a much earlier philosophical discussion of the utilitarianism, which says really everything has to be looked at with a benefit to society as a whole. So it's a, it's a philosophical underpinning, which goes all the way back to... Uh, the Greek times 
And you had mm-hmm. Sparta where the children that were unable to be productive members of society were not able to meet the criteria of strength and so forth. They were left to die uh, on the fields outside the city. And this goes back even further where there was the whole judgment as to who is really valuable, who is important. So once we see that there's that difference between um, the viewpoint of, of as I discu- discussed, the God of abundance, that mm. every human being is precious and essential. I love that. Versus the cult of scarcity, which says, no, there's some people that since things are scarce, since resources are scarce, then th- people have to be graded according to their ability. That leads to a whole world of choices. A choices as to who gets what, um, how many children people can have. Now is going up in uh, around the world uh, posters called One Planet, One Child, uh, encouraging people to the best gift a person can give to their a uh, single child is um, n- not to have another sibling, uh, which goes against all all belief in the God of abundance, obviously, and all all common sense, which is the greatest thing you can give a child is a sibling. Yeah. Um, but this is the attitude that comes from deciding who, what, when, and where is really um, important. And and the question is also who's getting to decide this. I Meaning to say. This was not even, and not that it is something that could be put to a vote because we do not have even that want to get into a discussion of this. This is not something to be put for a vote, but it w- it's it's uh, just been declared. This new term showed up. And what I'm what I'm bringing out is not a new term. It is something mm-hmm. that the Nazis used. It is the, the rule of public health. Who is really valuable? Who is acceptable? Who is healthy? These are all terminologies. Um, that that we have to be on a, on alert for, and we have to reject the use of this terminology and reject the use of any grading people, any grading people as essential and non-essential. Um, this is this is completely unacceptable. It absolutely is, and you know the thing that I think concerns me the most is this whole notion that something like that could never happen in America. You know, we have this sense of comfort that almost makes us apathetic in many ways because we just conform blindly and think okay it'll pass it'll pass let me just wear the mask let me just stay inside you know and the picture that you're being painted and if you don't follow that you're selfish and you're not concerned with other people's health like it's no longer about your personal responsibility to take care of yourself and your family but i'm now responsible and beholden to take care of everybody else's health and make sure that i'm doing all the things so the thing that I want to talk to you about is we, we spoke a little bit about history, but if you look at what's happening right now in Australia and New Zealand, and you touched upon this a little bit in Trenton, um, they are basically on lockdown. I think that in Australia, you're allowed to come out of your house one hour a week or something. I don't know if I'm misquoting it, but I've heard some crazy things. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about what's happening in those countries? So before I do that, I really want to go back to something you just said. Yes, please. It's very important to address this point that you said people can't imagine it could happen here. And, you know, there's so much talk about never again and and all these Mm -hmm. statements. But at the end of the day, um, it's instructive to see that the Lubavitcher Rebbe uh, was asked. He's a great teacher of of the Jewish people and of the whole world. He was asked in the 1960s by a New York Times reporter, um, could a Holocaust happen in America? Mm. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe's answer was Morgan in the Free. Morgan in the Free is Yiddish for tomorrow morning. So how is it possible that a Holocaust could happen in America tomorrow morning? The people here are kind. It's a nation of kindness. Um, we have you know, a great tradition of liberties and so forth. And the answer is that it only takes a small amount of fear to drive people wildly rushing to surrender the liberties and rushing to surrender themselves to a higher uh, government force and rushing to turn their neighbors in, Mm -hmm. in the panic and the fear, turn their neighbors in to the greater good and for the greater good. So uh, actually I'll pull over here. I I referenced this in the the, the talk and it might come out backwards on that, but this is a book that I ordered. It actually shows up. Okay. My opposition, this is actually written by a non-Jewish fellow. Mm-hmm. Uh, Friedrich Kellner, and um, the the description of how it worked in Germany, how they manipulated themselves into power and became um, unopposable, and how everyone was divided into the party and not the party, and 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 the way people were manipulated, and it was kind of they created this sense of ine- inevitability that no one is allowed to speak up for themselves anymore, no one is allowed to oppose them, and he, as a German non-Jew, he was um, 
wrote, he actually was a clerk in some municipal court or somewhere in the middle of Germany, and he was able to write about this. And he wrote a diary, exactly what was going on. If you read it, you see it is exactly what's happening now in America. And this is the key thing, because a lot of people say, well, you can't compare it to the Holocaust. Well, one second, we, the Holocaust is not about the end result. The Holocaust is about, and the whole Nazi um, representation of public health is, how did they gain control of the people, drive them into a frenzy in a very, very short period of time, and override the rest of the people who weren't in a frenzy, meaning to say most Germans were not even behind this. Um, but what they enable, were able to do is they created this thing that where you could not speak up against the party. You the constant profession of loyalty, the whole the whole concept of saying, you know, Heil Hitler is to everyone's checking everyone else. Ex how enthusiastic are you to show that you're willing to give one for the cause and you are willing to uh, pledge allegiance to the cause? And everyone's loyalty is constantly being checked in such a situation. And the same in, in communism, Marxism, it's all the same concept of, of totalitarian control and ruling over other human beings. And in order to have rulership, you have to bully people. And then you have to constantly keep people on their toes to prove that they are loyal to the authority. And that's what it's really about. That's what really they accomplished in a very, very efficient way, a very, very exceptionally clever organization. And they were able to take that and then when it came time to address the jewish the jewish people they were able to manipulate jewish leaders they were able to manipulate people to be able to carry that out so this week is the anniversary of um the killing of thirty thousand jews in kiev when the nazis came in in and really in a short two-day period and um and later another hundred twenty thousand jews and non-jews were killed in the same babi yar it's a it's a famous ravine there and the Nazis write that um, they only, when they put up these signs that all Jews must report to uh, the place with some, they're going to be relocated, they must come with some clothes, basic clothes, their jewelry and so forth. Um, they expected only 5,000 Jews would show up. But 30,000 showed up. And they, the commander wrote it was as a result of extremely clever organization. And what that means is... There was a lot going on behind the scenes that not just the signs, people only saw the signs on the wall, but there was a whole campaign to position people into thinking this was the best for their safety. And that not only that, but not showing up would endanger everybody else. Because the rule is always if you're going to resist, you're going to be inflaming the hatred and the animosity of the authorities. And therefore, everyone's going to get in danger. So everyone's trying to prevent anyone else from doing anything that's outside that that's involves resisting. So it really requires a lot of education and the education is just not there and has not been there uh, as to exactly how totalitarianism works, how um, the concept of cr having the desire to crush other human beings and then gaining that power and then actually implementing it. People do not study that anymore, how that happens. Mm -hmm. And so what we're left with is just a reliance on the, the, what the, the founders of this country saw the importance of setting up structures to protect against that. But people no longer have the presence of mind to understand why those structures are important to guard against what is possible in a totalitarian regime, what is possible in the hearts of human beings that are in the cult of scarcity. Yeah. And as a result, people don't see why it makes a difference. They're not even willing today to do anything to oppose this, people are afraid to get a fine. They're afraid of what's going to happen if they get arrested. It's going to be on their record. We could talk about that more when we get to Australia and New Zealand. But the, the concept that could happen tomorrow morning, God forbid, is that we see how people can be whipped up into a frenzy um, in a very short period of time. And leadership can be manipulated into turning their entire populations in to the higher good. And that higher good is public health. They're doing, They're doing it already. already. I mean, I, I, mean, I see... see in you have some feedback, I think. Yes, I know. Give me one second. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. So in New York, they had a whole campaign for 311 to call, call on your neighbor. If you see your neighbor outside, not socially distancing. I mean, I remember back in the heat of this, there were stories of people calling on children, sibling groups that were in the park playing together, not socially distancing. And the thing that surprises me the most is how upset and inflamed people get when you make this reference to the Holocaust. It, it, it's really something that triggers people. 
And I was so, you know, um, connected to that message, especially coming from, a, you know, a man that delivers the word of the Bible that is so deeply ingrained in faith and that obviously has a very emotional connection to what happens in the past. So hearing you talk about that, I mean, I literally had to hold back tears thinking about this anniversary and what these people went through. And we are being indoctrinated. It is a divide, conquer, and control type mentality that we've been living with for so long. And they keep describing it as this new normal. Every commercial that you see, people are wearing masks. You know, it's all about get your vaccines, make sure you're socially distancing, you know, stay home, save a life. So I so appreciate everything that you just said because I think it's a really important reminder for people. And like we said, Australia and New Zealand are already seeing these things. So let's talk about a little bit about the horrors that are taking place in those countries right now because it's a reality for them. It's not just a possibility. It, it's really a reality. And, and and leading into Australia and New Zealand, I want to share with you something that I saw that the Kloisenberger Rebbe, he was a, a man who lost his wife and 11 children in the Holocaust and they were taken by the Nazis. And then he was... Uh, forced into a labor camp, and he was uh, forced to clean up the Warsaw Ghetto uh, along with other Jews, and then he eventually was survived the war. Um, even at the last minute, the the Germans, uh, when the train was, came to a stop and, and everyone thought they were now safe, that when the doors of the trains opened, the, the Nazis machine gunned them uh, in, in trying to eliminate every last person that they felt their lives were unworthy of life. Even though they were, they they had already lost the war. They were still killing people because this is the this is the frenzy that is driven by the public health ideology. Because once you grade people, and they're a danger to to humanity, then there is no there is no logic. It is the logic is proven itself, which is they are a danger to humanity. So he he went on to found uh, reestablish a tremendous uh, uh, following of of Hasidim called the Kloisenberger Hasidim. Sans Hasidim. And uh, one of the things I saw that he wrote is he said after the First World War, uh, his father pulled him aside and said, I just want to let you know and um, that there's going to come into the world a cruelty that you have never and has never been seen in the world before. And he writes that when he was in the midst of the concentration camps and he was in the midst of, he went, I think, to four concentration camps and he was in the death march and many, many different near-death experiences, he said the only thing that kept him alive was recognizing that his father had told him that there would be this level of cruelty. Now, why is that relevant to our discussion? Because this is the level of cruelty of public health. Meaning to say, the public health ideology says that in the for the, everyone and every individual can and must be sacrificed for the sake of the public health altar. And the end result is the, the every police officer, every officer becomes the most cruel, cruel human being. They could they could shoot people, they could separate families, which we're starting to see now that families are even turning on themselves because they're saying, well, the kid is tested positive, he can't come in the house. All these kind of uh, things that result from the belief that there's danger in the air and that the public health is the highest priority. Now, why is that relevant? We have to realize what's going on over here because in the old days, um, in previous situations, let's say, that, and, and many people, you know, from time to time had to feed, flee tyranny, but it was possible, let's say, to bribe a police officer. It was possible to, to find. So if, if someone, by bribing the police officer and letting a Jew go, um, he, let's say, pocketed the change and, and he let this person escape. But when it comes to public health, when you say that these people are a danger to these people who are positive, let's say, or the people who are cases, or the per people who have been con in contact with or have been close to someone as a case, they are now a danger to the entire society. So there is no concept of mercy. There's not even a concept of, of personal gain in the case of a bribery overcoming the, the indoctrination of this police officer or this health official or the school principal or the school nurse saying this person's a danger to humanity and they must be stopped. They must be quarantined and anyone who's speaking out against it must be stopped from speaking because they're endangering, going to bring death to everybody. So this is the, the level of that people are driven to and they are able to execute with robotic determination that no longer has any humanity to it. And that's what we saw in the Nazi officers. And that's what we're seeing now in the videos coming out of Australia, that they are able to wear literally black uniforms that 
are robotic looking. They look something out of Star Trek and they look like the Nazi stormtroopers. And they are being sent into uh, the one that I saw was about a marketplace. They're just knocking people over. They'll just knock men, women, elderly people onto the ground because they're on a mission. And the mission is public health. They are there to protect everyone from dying and everyone from being infected by these people who are diseased. And anyone who's violating the rules is therefore a threat. And you saw that everyone saw the famous um, the recording of the pregnant lady who is crying and she's being arrested because she put a post on Facebook. And the officers, you cannot even reason with them. You know, when you have even a person who's getting arrested in the United States of America for a crime, the police officers are, are can be very compassionate and, and, and helpful and so forth because the, the, everyone is, is understanding that this person is still a human being. And maybe they committed a crime and they need to be arrested, they need to be put, taken to jail, but it's still a human being. But in, in general, I mean, obviously there's exceptions, but in general, but in this type of situation, you see the look on the officers, there's nothing, there's no one to talk to there. They have checked out their humanity in favor of an ideology called public health, which is that is the only judge. It doesn't matter whether it's in the law. It doesn't matter whether it's illegal. It doesn't matter what it's harmful, what you did. If it threatens public health, Therefore, anything can be done to that person. And, and that's, what, that's what we're seeing now. That's what we're seeing happen in New Zealand. That's what we're seeing happen in Australia, where out of this fear, people are literally being crushed, beaten, um, and, and there's more to come. I mean, to say the, the laws that are being passed and the, the ratification by these uh, the, the governors and the legislatures of this public health um, ideology, it runs in lockstep over the entire world. Meaning to say every country is, is either one bit ahead or one bit behind in what's happening. Yeah. And and this is this is the this is what we're seeing, like you said, in Australia, we're seeing a presage of what's gonna happen here, God forbid. Um, and and in New Zealand, um, where they, they basically disarmed the entire population a few months ago in response, they took away all the long guns in response to the uh, attack that someone did in a mosque. And then they immediately, the next day, they were ready with legislation to take away all the guns. Um, they forced everyone to turn in their guns. And then all the weapons were destroyed. They actually destroyed them. You can't go and find them in an arsenal somewhere. They were actually destroyed. And now the people are totally defenseless. They're locked down in, the, in what people are saying is the worst lockdown in the world. So you see that what government is and people, it's, the government is not uh, just an institution. It's actual human beings that have... The desire to control others and it's naive to think that it can't happen in any country it can happen in every single country um and it's happening yeah i mean the signs are here and it's funny because i remember you know in december and january obviously there was a lot of um, unrest in new jersey with uh, religious exemptions and certain things being threatened and we saw that all over the world we saw populations in china and in Italy and all these different countries rising up against medical mandates. And all of a sudden in March, it's like everybody's just been silenced and quiet. And I really, when I think about this plan, because I believe that this has been something that has been planned out for a really long time. This is the process of dehumanization. That's really what this is about. We are conducting one of the largest social experiments to date, in my opinion. And the masks, the social distancing, the indoctrination in the schools. I mean, they're actually spending time with children with IEPs to train them on the importance of wearing masks and how to wear masks properly. This is being incorporated into the curriculum. Children are coming home with worksheets, coloring, good behavior is wearing your mask and staying away from your friends. Bad behavior is getting too close and hugging your friends. I mean, the stuff that I'm seeing rocks me to my core. So. What I want to ask you is the masks, the social distancing, all of the things that's happening. What do you think the correlation is to some of these mandatory vaccine mandates and medical mandates that we're seeing in regards to the public health? Like, Do you, do you see a correlation? The, co the whole point is to create a superseding authority that then rules every aspect of a person's life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have any correlation to science or medicine. And just to give you an illustrative example, and you're talking about the education of these kids, when the when the communists took over in Russia, they came to the rabbis, they came to all the leaders, and they said, um, you know, you could keep your religious schools, but the only thing is we require secular studies in the afternoons. Now, by way of background, 
the, the rabbis had fought against the attempts of the czar to implement secular education in the afternoons because they understood that secular education was, it's not about whether or not you learn math or not, it's about in a whole world view, which is from the cult of scarcity. Yeah. So the kids were, the, the people were protected from that. Uh, they, they didn't want the kids to be educated with that. As, as you know, it's, it's fine to learn technical skills and how to be an engineer, but to learn the cult of scarcity is not something that's acceptable. So when the when the communists came took in uh, took over, they came to the um, to everybody and they said, okay, you could continue your religious schools, uh, but you have to have secular education in the afternoon. So the rabbis gave into that and they said, well, you know, it's it's not so bad because they're doing it to everybody. Everyone has the secular education in the afternoon. So what happened was after two years of this, lo and behold, the children who had been going to these schools they prevented their parents going to the synagogue. Because they had been indoctrinated for the good of the country and the good of the everyone, the, the public good, the public welfare, the public health, was that people should not be going to the synagogue. That was a danger. So now the parents were prevented by their own kids. Now, you can see this actually unfolding in real time right now. If you go to a website called brainpop.com, okay. you, can, you can find, which is targeting, targeted messaging at children. Um, it has an interview with Dr. Fauci. And it's you can watch there. The Dr. Fauci is speaking from a television set on the wall, and he is telling the kids that they should, and and, and the, the um, in combination with the moderator, that they should tell their parents that good behavior is to wear. They should remind the parents when they go to the house that they should wear their masks. So this is the turning over of the proper relationship between parent and child that the parent instructs his child and guides them as they see best, and they and they do know best because God put them in that position. Uh, God put them in the position as parents to give them that gift of, of guidance. That's being overturned right now. It's been overturned for many decades in the schools, but now it's accelerating. And so what you're seeing there in the IEPs is exactly what the plan is. And the mistake is that the rabbis made in Russia is they said, well, it affects everyone equally. It doesn't it, If it's wrong, it doesn't matter if it affects everyone equally. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And we can't say, oh, well, look, everyone has to be locked up. You know, I don't like these arguments that they make in these court cases on behalf of the synagogues and the churches. And they say, it's not fair that, uh, you know, 50 people can gather at a, at a, um, at a uh, you know, uh, some secular event and only 10 um, people can gather in a church or a synagogue. That's, that shows unfairness. That shows, you know, there should be equality. There has to be, you're, you're treating disparate treatment of religious people. Hold on a second here. I, I, I when I, they make these arguments, I, what are you talking about? It's wrong to limit them to fifty people. It's what? long wrong to say that Home Depot can only have a uh, hundred people in it. Why are you trying to say everyone should be cut down to the same level? That is the fallacy of everyone just scrambling at the trough, so to speak, to get to get the best from the governor, to get the best. For the, okay, we should we shouldn't be treated less than anyone else. You want to beat everyone? Beat everyone equally. That's the fundamental argument these churches and synagogues are making, and it's false. It's false, and it's a betrayal of humanity. The only right answer is to say this power on other people and saying how many people can gather together at any time in any place for any reason is absolutely unacceptable, and it will not be tolerated. Yeah, and, and the thing is, what was open and what was closed, so churches, synagogues, mosques, all these places of worship closed. But Planned Parenthood, big box stores, liquor stores, those things were open. So the the whole, my father says all the time that there's a movie called The Devil's Advocate. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he said that Satan ruled the 20th, 20, 20th century. That was, the movie was in 1990 something. And truly like evil is running the show right now. I really believe that we are at spiritual warfare in the biggest way. And there is an innate battle of good versus evil right now. And the evil is actually being positioned as the good. Like they're doing such a good job of flipping it around because they've indoctrinated all the right. places that people go for information, the education system, the politicians, the, the media. I mean, it's you can't escape from it. And I'm seeing it with my own son. I mean, my son is very much like follow the rules. You know, why do you have to not wear a mask? Wear the mask, it's the rules, you're breaking the rules. So. Right. The goal here is to really separate the family unit because the education, ethics, morals, values that our kids will be brought up with will be so very different from what we've been brought up with that that relationship and that ability to relate to one another will be impacted. So it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Well, it's, it's extremely dangerous and it is 
it's working. You know, say, Satan doesn't run the run the run the world. God does, and I'm that's we have to realize that there's a small amount of people that participate in the cult of scarcity, but they they convince everyone else to follow their rules. So just as an example, I was saying before with the disparate treatment argument and you know the, whether it's an undue burden on religion and, and strict scrutiny and all these legal doctrines that they use, they throw around at the Supreme Court, fundamentally they're all wrong. And the reason is because there is not allowed to be a burden, you're not allowed to prevent people from uh, um, having a religious gathering and from praying. So what happens, you have all these lawyers that have been trained, including religious Jewish lawyers and religious Christian lawyers that say, well, these are the rules. As long as the law does not disproportionately or disparately affect religion, then it's constitutional. No, 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 no. That's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says free exercise of religion, free exercise, free assembly. It does not say anywhere that it's okay to shut down a synagogue and a church as long as everything else is shut down equally. That's just a falsehood that they've been trained in law school. And I went to the same law school myself. I mean, I, I, I saw this being presented to us. And we're yeah. supposed to take this. And what happens is that people do not even realize that there exists a world beyond that thinking. And the world that beyond that exists beyond that thinking is the world that was seen by the great sages of all time, the great people that founded this country. They did not think like this. They did not find it acceptable. And it's interesting. I'll just point out, we were talking about the, the founders of this country. You know, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bill of Rights that uh, the government can't close down everyone's businesses. And you know Why? Why? Because the founders of the United States, it never occurred to them that King George would close down everyone's businesses. It is so beyond, beyond, what? I said they didn't know King Murphy. Apparently it's above his pay grade. It's, it's beyond, it's beyond human conception that someone would say you can't go make a living. They didn't even think to put it in the Bill of Rights. Okay, we've seen people force religion on people. We've seen people take away weapons. We've seen people search and do, you know, unlawful search and seizure, not let people have a, a jury. That they all saw. But they they never imagined that someone would just say no one could go to work today, and that shows us that you you have to you have to be connected to the fundamental principles of life. That's why we're saying it's a spiritual problem. If you're going ahead and you're going to church or synagogue and you still think that the principle that the church the, the Supreme Court enunciates that it's a law is constitutional as long as it does not have a disparate effect or an undue burden on religion, and you think that is part of the Constitution, you just checked out yeah. of what spirituality means and what God is saying to humanity, which is that there is nothing that can come between um, a human being and his, and his creator, and there's no government force that is allowed to prevent a human being from serving his creator. There's no government force that could allow a person, stop a person from making a living and feeding his family. That is, you don't need to read any Supreme Court decisions to be able to understand that because that is... It's just the fundamental truth that this country was built on and humanity and previous generations already recognize that. I mean, if there was a mic drop emoji that was available right now, I would just, I would have to post it in the comments because a hundred percent, I agree with you on everything that you said. And I think that the scary thing is that the constitution is something that we're moving further and further away from. Like the fact I moved from New York to New Jersey and in New York, when I was leaving, if you wanted to get a religious exemption for vaccines, you had to go in front of a sincerity panel to prove that your religious beliefs were sincerely held and they got to decide if they believed you or not. And when you think about the constitution, how could it be that I, as a mother who carried my child, who gave myself injections every day for nine months to keep this pregnancy and did everything that I could to bring this child into the world that I love more than anything, that I have to prove my beliefs or that the decisions that I'm making for him are in his best interest to a governing body. It's, it's so far beyond comprehension to me, but so many people just feel like, well, you know, it's for the greater good. It's something that we have to do. You gotta take one for the team. That's public health. Mm -hmm. Public health is all about the greater good. And in the greater good, there is elimination of the individual and there's elimination of humanity. Because the dehuman dehumanization right now is occurring as we're speaking. Making people wear masks is dehumanizing people. Why? Number one is the, the, the image of God is on a person's face. Even a non-Jew is not allowed to be cremated because um, you're not allowed to destroy a person's face. 
Uh, you you cannot breathe properly. A lot of people report breathing issues. That's definitely, it says that God breathed into a person. The, the process of breathing in and out is a process of, of, of God breathing our soul into us and our life into us. And in addition, our whole way that we're able to interact with each other is through the, the so many neurons that are picking up the tiny minuscule um, effects of 3,000 muscles in our face. All the tiny little details, when you block that out, you are basically dehumanizing the person that is uh, covered and you're dehumanizing the people that are looking at it. So this is the process of dehumanizing people. And once they're dehumanized, then they, it's part of the essential, non-essential. Then it just, there, there is no limit to what could occur, God forbid, because they're dehumanized. They could be treated and, and be forced to do anything as a result because they're no longer and and they the, the people who are doing it unfortunately are doing it they're doing it to themselves mm -hmm. because there's no one that's forcing anyone to wear a mask it's it's truly voluntary i mean people people don't break the law will tell them, let's, let's check how many people are going the speed limit on the garden state parkway right mm -hmm. everyone has and how many people you know everyone's f filing the taxes honestly okay i hope so but the fact of the matter is how many people are doing cash businesses when it comes to wearing a mask all of a sudden or or keeping six feet human avoidance all of a sudden oh this is a law you can't break why because it is public health and therefore they are dehumanizing themselves by buying into this this ideological really a the cult of scarcity viewpoint they're dehumanizing themselves it's all voluntary and that that's really the goal at the end of the day the goal is that it should all be voluntary because we see that they, the, the Marx, the, the communists in, in um, Russia, they always had people sign confessions before they shot them. They yeah. didn't shoot the people who didn't sign the confessions. Amazingly enough, person, if he didn't give in, they didn't kill him. So there's some stories of, of Chabad Hasidim that they actually got released from prison because they were so unbreakable, the government just gave, the communists just gave up. The people were getting shot down the hallway where the people would sign the confessions because it, it's all about consent. Consent, consent. They want people to consent and and uh, subjugate themselves voluntarily mm -hmm. to this cult of scarcity. Once a person gives in, then they can be eliminated. Yeah. The people who don't give in are the people that that they still need to find a way to break because they're not broken yet. And there's well, no advantage to killing someone that won't break. Here's the thing. I mean, I think that one of the most astonishing things to me is how many people because i don't wear a mask i mean I, I just i see it as counterintuitive to do something that makes me feel ill every time i do it and i i did it you know months past but i'm no longer doing it and i see so many people in stores that will come over and say how are you not wearing a mask and it's like how are you wearing the mask like it's so mind-blowing to them the concept that here i am this unicorn in a sea of people who just choose to comply with something that makes no sense whatsoever um they they don't even understand how it's possible like i can't shop in a store i won't be able so this cult of scarcity that you talk about is really a powerful hold because people believe wholeheartedly that if they don't comply, that these consequences are going to come befalling on them, where they're going to be in danger or they're going to be without food, without you know anything that they need. And what I want to say to people is it's a decision. It's a choice. This is our vessel. This is our body, our spirit. Everything that's essential to us is encased in this this thing that's here right now, this body that we have to take care of. But it's become this virtue signaling. So I think the biggest thing that people feel is almost like, you know, walking around with that scarlet letter A, or it's been compared to um, the yellow star, which I don't know how you feel about that. I know that a couple of people that have made that reference when it comes to like the vaccinated, unvaccinated populations and now the mask and not the mask, that it's almost like marking you, marking you to say, okay, you're, you're good, you're clean, you're following the rules, you're not, you're unclean, you're not vaccinated, you're not following the rules, you're not wearing the mask. What is your feeling about that? Well, before, that, before we talk about that, I want to say there's something, there's an even deeper issue over here. Yes, please. Which is that if a person is willing to wear a mask after they've been told by a government that they will not be able to get food unless they wear a mask, mm -hmm. that person, there's a spiritual problem here. Let's Let's say that again. The people that are wearing masks are wearing masks because they've been told by a government that they cannot buy food unless they wear the mask. So they're willing to comply in order to get the food they need. 
that is how far they've been broken already. They are, and, and they, they don't even see what's happening. They don't see that the government is saying they will not get food, that they're being bullied into this because there's some people that believe that there's a danger in the air and they think that there's a danger without wearing masks and they're afraid of, of, of that. But a large percent of the people are only wearing the mask because they have to do it. And they have to do it because they're volunteering to do it because they've agreed to allow a system to, they're agreed to, they're, the people are creating the system. Everyone talks about the governor. The governor is not the problem. The governor could sign any decrees he wants. The question is, will people follow them? And if people are following them and they're following them and, and they're being bullied into saying they will agree to create a system where you cannot get food without a mask, they have a serious spiritual a, a, a spiritual failing, which is that which, which, which they've been demoralized. The spiritual failing is they've been demoralized. They've become so subjugated and they've subjugated themselves. They are demoralized and, and they do not even have the fighting spirit to say, wait one second, why is someone telling me I can't eat unless I wear a mask? I will just, even if I don't understand it, that's something I would resist because why is someone threatening my food and my life if I don't do something? So what we need to do is we need to remoralize people. It's not about when you go into the store and the person's not wearing them, they're wearing a mask and they're not, they're wearing a mask and you're not. I see that as an opportunity to explain to people directly. It's not about the governor. Mm -hmm. It's not about the mask. It's not about anything that's in front of us right now. It's about the question is, do you believe in the God of abundance? Are you grounded in a reality that is beyond yourself, beyond your current needs? And do you believe and trust and are you willing to accept and, and live and fall into the reality that there's a God of abundance that will take care of everything you need? And you do not have to subjugate to yourself. You do not have to subjugate yourself to a human being that's going to tell you no food unless you do this. That's what needs to be communicated to people. And if they still wear a mask after that then you know the next opportunity to speak to them again because they've been everyone's been demoralized over decades yeah it's the true. remoralization process actually does not have to take decades it could happen in an instant because the god of abundance is always available to us and as these orders and decrees become more and more harsh and totalitarian and cruel it will give the opportunity for more and more people to wake up so don't give up hope the person that you i got an, i got a message from somebody that said, um, because now they're playing games with the schools, with the Jewish schools, and they're threatening the, the, the schools that if they don't, you know, do test everybody, they're going to close them all down and, and this type of real, real bullying. So after one of the schools closed, someone sent me a message, text message, and uh, I don't know if I'll find it in, in here, but it's not really the, the, I can find the exact language, but he said to me, um, I, I didn't, I didn't believe you. Basically, he didn't. When I sent out that letter, he's like, I, I didn't really believe you. I get those messages. Now, but now, oh, here, that's what he said. Listen, I didn't believe it at first, but you're so on target. This is what he texted to me. This sounds like modern incarnation of Yovan. Yovan is the Hebrew word for Greece. Greece was about the public health, all about the ideal, ideal idealization of the human body and the human um, mental prowess and so forth and, and eliminating anything that didn't fit with that. And um, that's where the Olympics comes from, all this idealization of, of the human, the physique and, and so forth. That was, that's the Greek process. And, and they had to war against Judaism and against Torah because Torah transcends all that. It doesn't, put, it, it doesn't require us to have a certain physique or to have a certain health or to have anything in particular, it requires us to be in service of God and service of our fellow human being. And therefore, the, the Greeks shut down all the Jewish schools. And that's why we have Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the whole story. Uh, uh, even most non-Jews are familiar with the concept of a dreidel, which you spin the little dreidel and it has four sides. Why was that? Because the, the Greeks said you cannot have any Jewish education, no Torah schools at all. So... In those days, they didn't ban people coming together. They just said you can't study Torah. So when the German off the, the Greek officers would come to inspect where the kids were uh, located, the kids would take out these little dreidels and then they would spin them and they would pretend that they were playing this game. So that's what we're facing right now. We're coming to a situation. Hanukkah is coming up in an, in another uh, two and a half months, um, and 
we're going to have a situation where the schools are going to be shut down. But there's a big difference that's even worse than the time of the Greeks. The times of the Greeks, people couldn't study Torah, but the kids could still get together and play. Now they're saying the kids can't get together anymore. Everyone has to stay apart. Everyone's going to be contact traced and quarantined. And the problem with this contact tracing, which we could talk about a little bit more, but one of the big devastating effects is that everyone is afraid to allow anyone else into their house. Be, not because of the, the virus, not because of any disease. Even the people who know it's, there's nothing to, to be way, f- afraid of because they're healthy and there's nothing to be afraid of. They're afraid that if a person comes into their house who then gets tagged later on by someone else, then they're tagged and then their whole life is turned upside down and everyone has to quarantine. So the kids won't even be there together to learn Torah and then pretend that they're just playing dreidel. They will not even be allowed to get together, God forbid. That's the descent that we're going into. So I told you that whole story. I got to the point that this man said to me, he didn't believe me at first. Mm-hmm. And now he sees I'm right on. Because now as, as it accelerates, more and more people wake up. So I want to encourage you and everyone who's listening that we have to fall to the trap of all the us against them in, in history is everyone writes off everybody else. It's, oh, those are those type of people. These people are are like that. They're, they're kind of, they're, they are in unapproachable. They're incorrigible. Whatever you think is wrong with them, they can never, you know, change. And they're just diehard in the world, world uh, people that hate, hate, every, you know, whatever, whoever you are, there's these people that hate you. And the answer is it's just not the way humanity is and the way humanity works. And what we need to do is that even if someone is our opponent uh, superficially, we have to realize that they are fundamentally a good human being being created by the same God of abundance that's creating us. And we need to know that they still have that spark of humanity in them. And we need to keep, keep, keep lovingly talking to them. And they will come around. Even the big people who have the, um, the, 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 pl- the money to fund all these kind of uh, public health programs, they themselves got into this. You know, how, how, did, how does a rich guy get into this, um, this whole thing where they're now... Uh, he's, you know, so using all his money to to force people to follow a public health mandate. Because, simply speaking, he he got to a certain point in life. He wanted a higher spiritual calling, and he was he was in he was brought into the cult of scarcity. Oh, you want to really get to sp- spiritual? He got onto the wrong track, and the ego is built up, and the power is built up, and so forth. And and that's how a person gets indoctrinated into the cult of scarcity. Just like at the lowest level. A politician is told to make compromises because in order to get himself into the county party level and then he gets up to the, maybe he's going to get a seat as an alderman or as a council member or a county a freeholder. And then he's going to, if he does everything right, he'll become a candidate for the assembly. And then if you do everything right, maybe you'll get an ambassadorship or you'll get sent to Washington. You'll become a governor. You're making compromises all along because of the cult of scarcity. You can't actually say what's true. And the same thing is, this is what people are indoctrinated into. So the same thing is in the college campuses. The professors for decades have been limited what they could say in order to get the tenure. If first to get a PhD, then you have to get a tenure. Then you have to stay in good standing with the academic senate. Then you have to make sure that you pr- behave properly so that you get interviewed on the news stations. And so you can get your grant money from the NIH and, the, and, and these entities that are controlling who gets all the money to the United States of America. So people are making all these little compromises all, the, all, the, all along. So by the time they get to this position now, that's why among the people who are currently getting grant money from the NIH, no one is speaking up against the head of infectious disease at the National Institutes of Health. It looks like everyone agrees with him. Why? Because they've all made the compromises from the very first day they became an undergraduate or, an, or graduate student to go with the system, to go with the system, to ignore the the possibilities of anything other than the the what they're being told is the, the official line. So it's no wonder that these people act this way. They're innocently following the path and the pattern of all the compromises they made all along. Now, when a person coming speaking the truth comes along, you have to look them in the eye and see their innocence. They made a compromise when they were 23, 24 years old to get that graduate position and keep the graduate grant and then to get the, scholar, the, get, to get the lab uh, seat and so forth. They've been making all these compromises all along from their own demoralization. And can you imagine how tragic it is a person who started out all optimistic they're going to save the world 
And then they be, made all these compromises. And now they've been more, if every time a person makes one of these compromises, they become more demoralized, yeah. more and more and more demoralized. So now you're looking at a demoralized human being with no, no matter how many white lab coats he has and how many degrees. Now, what are you going to feel for that person when you see what's really going on for him? Compassion. He could be saying everything you don't, you disagree with, but he's not doing it out of anything other than innocently having mis been misled and volunteered to be to stay in that track all along. So now that's what we need to see. And this is what the power of the Torah is. Because the Torah says, King David says, Nashi ki rabim hayu umodi. It says in, in chapter 55, my soul was redeemed in peace because the multitudes were with me. So who were these multitudes? He was basically a very, very um, uh, outnumbered. The multitudes that were with him were his opponents. The soldiers that were fighting against him were on his side because deep down they recognized his godliness. They recognized the truth of what he was doing. And even though they were going through the motions of fighting for his enemies, they deep down, their godly spirit recognized that they wanted him to be victorious. So that's how he was redeemed in peace. He didn't have to, um, he didn't have to go through the level of, of violence and bloodshed, God forbid, that we don't want to go through. What he saw was that, that they were on his side. And that's really the message of the Torah. Every single human being is on our side, no matter how deep they are into the cult of scarcity. They are on our side. And they're all waiting. They're all begging for humanity to stand up and, and, and just continue and, and improve life and improve everything for everybody and throw off this these chains of slavery. Because... That's what's going to redeem them. They are not redeemed. Right now, they're in a prison of the cult of scarcity, and they have to watch what they say, and they have to make sure to be uh, showing uh, um, that they they, they, they they agree with whoever's you know, saying all the official pronouncements. They have to show their felicitude. They have to show their, their obsequiousness. They have to show everything every day, every minute. They're being judged. Their emails, when they send them out, they have to make sure they don't say anything that's going to offend the public health authorities and maybe sound too too extreme. They're in prison. Yeah. The only way they have out, because they've already decided that they can't leave voluntarily, is if the people wake up and step up. So I've gotten emails from doctors who are participating in these and, and, and messages from doctors and communications with doctors who are so involved in a, in a mesh in this. And they're like, keep doing what you're doing. Because they can't come out and say what we're saying is right. But we are their only salvation. The only way they have a hope to be able to get out of this is if this whole trap they put themselves into becomes broken. That's what Torah is telling us. That's the strength of the Torah. You look at every human being, no matter what they're saying and what they're exhibiting, you look at the goodness in them, that they're created by God in God's image, and they are going to return to that. I, I can't tell you how full my heart is hearing you say that because it's truly what keeps me going is just believing that at the root of every person is good and i think for a lot of people right now this cult of scarcity this ability to no longer be able to choose faith over the fear that's everywhere has people coming out with the worst sides of themselves and we need that gentle reminder sometimes to come from compassion and to come from love and empathy and understanding because it's really easy. And, and I've, I've had to battle this myself. There was a time during this whole quarantine. I mean, I'm a yoga instructor and a health coach, and I really try to stay zen. I, I, you know, I have my relationship with God, and I pray. But there was a time during this quarantine where I was so angry. I was so angry seeing what the world had become and thinking about my son growing up this way. And you feel helpless at times. Like you feel like you're, you're on a hamster wheel and you're just circling around and circling around and circling around. And there's this, this notion a lot of times that, you know, our government is so powerful and there's so much money behind this and we're just us. We're just, you know, I'm just a mom or I'm just a dad or a grandparent or a rabbi or a priest. How can I make a difference? So what you just said about being the bearer of hope, being the person who leads by example, being the change. That's the message that we have to continue to put out there. So I so appreciate 
you reminding me because I need that sometimes. It is not easy in the times that we're living in and, and fear truly is a factor for a lot of us, especially when you have children that you, you know, you want them to live happy, healthy, and free. So for people who are struggling with their relationship with God, with um, being able to come from a faithful place, who are experiencing stress and anxiety and really deep in to that place of worry and lack of control, what last words would you want to give those people as far as how they can make a difference and where this is all going? All the rules that each one of us make are just our thoughts. We have rules that we can't be an outcast. We have a rule that we have to be somehow saying something that's going to be agreeable to everybody. If we look through the Torah, we see that every single one of the greatest people was an outcast. Avraham Avinu, Abraham our father, was a man who was born in a time when the ruling person, who was King Nimrod, wanted to rule the entire world, and he was afraid of a threat from a child that was going to be born and was going to rise up against him. And he created birthing centers, hospitals, to, to the maternity wards, where all the mothers had to give birth in order to control the population. And his father and, and his uh, Abraham's father and mother, they decided to break from that. And they ended off giving birth at home. And when the guards figured this out through their own sort of uh, their, their astrologers, they were able to determine that there was uh, someone had escaped this net. And they came and they asked uh, uh, Terach, was his name, the father of Abraham, to turn over his son. He refused. And they went back to get further instructions. And in that time, that's when Abraham's mother and took him, the newborn, and and hid in a and uh, raised him in a cave for years. Be, and then when he he was able then to grow up free of that um, tyranny of thinking around him, he was able to then recognize there's an Almighty God that is all powerful. And he was then able to go back and confront Nimrod, and stand up against him. And then lead the the greatest uh, creation of, of awareness among humanity in the history of the world that is continuing today with the Jewish people bringing the awareness of God's oneness to the to to humanity. That's what he created. So he was he was an outcast by all by all calculations, as was Moses and King David, and and we could go through all the people that were outcasts. Joseph was an outcast from his family. That is a badge of honor. Mm. And it's really these rules that we create. And then we feel a struggle because, well, if we're thinking independently, we want to stay connected to God, but then we're not accepted by everyone else, then we feel a sense of conflict. But there's no real conflict. The conflict is only in our thinking about the rules that we created that it's supposed to be a certain way. Mm. And when we, when we are able to be reflective and just allow all that thinking to pass and in the quiet moment, which it will, the thinking, all that chaos thinking, all that pressure thinking, all the rules that we've created for ourselves, the way it's supposed to be, and what's going to happen if our children are raised a certain way. What happens if they're raised independently? So think independently. This is the thoughts that go through our head all the time. We let those go. And what we see is that there's a loving, embracing God that's taking care of us at every moment. We, we realize that we're breathing. When we realize that the people around us that we have, the fact that we're alive, the goodness that God has been taking has been with us at every moment moment of our lives is with us right now and always will be it's not an outcome determined determined uh, equation it's about knowing that we are alive and we were created right now by god and that's a that that is what abraham took upon himself to bring this message to all of humanity that god loves every single human being and the proof is you're alive he's yeah. giving you this this energy this breathing he's giving you everything that you need to be alive and all the all the challenges that we face are really opportunities to see past the rules that we've put in our heads and and thought up and realize we can let them all go and the connection with god is through recognizing him starting a day with gratitude we say you know the first thing we wake up is we start with expression of gratitude thank you god for giving me back my soul and for your restoring me and for your faith in me that is how we start every day. And then the, the day just the day, day rolls beautifully from there. And then we, we see that God, how he wants us to conduct ourselves. We have the, the we don't we don't make sure not to steal and take things that don't belong to us. We make sure not to acknowledge and bow down to other ideologies. We make sure that we're going to um, not harm another person and by killing them and, and so on and so forth and not be immoral. 
these are the framework that then just leads to a beautiful life. And regardless of what's going around with us and whether we are living in a palace or whether a person sitting in a, in a jail cell, even unjustly, he still has the ability and he is connected to God Almighty at that moment. So that's that's a suggestion. And everyone, everyone could take that and will have their own insights, which will be far greater than mine. I literally, I'm so blessed and grateful that this crazy journey connected us. My heart is so full from this interview, like just being able to speak to you. And yeah, we did talk a little bit about some of the things that are going wrong, but leaving off on this note is such a powerful thing because hope is what gets us through and hope is what gives us strength to keep going on those days that feel like there's a 20 pound weight on your chest and we all have those days. So I want to make sure that people can get in touch with you. Um, please follow and go on the website, PaseaClarity.org. You can sign up for the email list there. Um, Rabbi David sends all types of emails out with updates. He has an amazing letter that he sends to rabbis in different um, synagogues throughout New Jersey. So please feel free to go on there, subscribe, make sure that you're staying up to date. This issue of freedom is something that affects us. It doesn't matter what religion, what ethnic, what ethnic, what ethnicity, what sex, what gender. It doesn't matter any of these things. We all need to unite and make sure that we are on the right side of history right now because there is a battle between good and evil. There is a battle for freedom. There is a battle to keep our humanness within us to make sure that we stay connected to other people and to move through these times united versus fighting and chaos and all the things that we just talked about. So Rabbi, I am so thankful that you spent the time with me tonight. Any closing thoughts, anything else that you'd like to say before we close it up tonight? You would ask me for the link to the um, to the press conference. Yes. And uh, maybe what I could do is just, I could um, copy that. How do I, how do I send that to you? Is there some way in well, this? Not in this, but what you can do is you can send it to me either through email or text message, and I can post it in the comments. Do so you want to talk a little bit about that press conference to let people know what they could be looking out for in the comments? Yeah, well, it, 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 you'll see that, um, because we brought it up at the beginning, um, that the concept of just recognizing what happens when we take, when we get separated from our creator, and, and that the concept of, of a doctor having the authority to decide who's terminally ill, which is a life unworthy, a life under the euthanasia statute, um, and then being able to poison the um, the patient is is that's what's going un, un, that's what's unfolding around us and in our and our, our lack of and our in our demoralization we start to buy the ideas that somehow it's compassionate and it's caring and so forth but what it's really creating is a death machinery and that's what we need to be cognizant of so um, I'll, I'll send you that text message right now and anyone who wants to watch it could yeah um, I really posted you have, on the you have WhatsApp or. But um, I have WhatsApp, yeah. You send you it, I can I'll definitely send, right now. I have to send it to myself and post it, but I definitely will share it with everybody so you can watch it. Um, I thank you so much for being here, for spending the time with us. I really appreciate it. I know from the comments that people really loved having you. So we may have to do this again to touch base because I think your message is so powerful and so inspiring. And it's something that every person needs to hear just to remind us that good will prevail over evil and we need to keep the faith yeah i think that's that's uh, you know say one was the final word i know we're past time but you know that the inevitability of hope hope is the our understanding it's it's a connection with the giver of hope mm. which is god almighty and and that is the knowing that that is what inevitably is going to prevail and it and it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process it could be instantaneous for yeah, all of yeah. us and that's what we're praying for and that's what we're taking action for yeah so thank absolutely you. Thank you, Thank you very much for, for making this possible. And I'm happy to have you know, met you and hope we'll get to do this again. We definitely will. So for all of you that are watching, please make sure that you go on, you check out PaseaClarity.org. And for many of us, we know that censorship is a real thing. It's happening every single day on Facebook and all different types of social media platforms. We know tomorrow that there are some rumors of things being taken down, pages being taken down. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to please sign up for my mailing list so that I have a way to keep in touch with you. If for some reason my page is shut down, the link is here, but I've also posted it in the comments, so please take a look at it. I can share it again above this post. 
sign up, you'll get updates, you'll get live feeds. If you're not currently following me on my website, go to wellnesswarriorsrevolution.com. I will be making some changes to that site to incorporate the videos that I'm doing so that they have a place to live. And last but certainly not least, many of you know about Brio TV. So you have an opportunity to become a founding subscriber at Brio TV. It is the place where truth lives amidst the fake news media. So it is a censorship free platform and we have the ability to keep all of our content, all of our important information safe and up without censorship. And they've been kind enough to extend a discount to all of my followers. So when you go on, use the code Freedom Warriors and you'll get a discount. Instead of paying $14.99 a month for that membership, you'll pay only $9.99 a month. And it's basically like Netflix meets YouTube without the censorship. So there'll be all types of content on there, political religious, medical freedom, health and wellness. Um, it's going to be a variety and it's growing every single day. So we need all of you to help to support us to make this platform the next YouTube. So share it with your friends. Please follow me on this page, Stephanie Lucretio, Wellness Warriors Revolution. I'll also post my parlor, my Instagram, my Wimkin, all those different things. So find me on social media in case for some reason I'm not here tomorrow because one thing that we've learned in 2020 is we can take nothing for granted. So I thank you all so much for constantly being here, for your love, for your support, for your kind words, and for showing up last week in mass in Trenton. It was such a proud moment for me, and it has created so many amazing connections. So I encourage you all to continue to show up, to stand up, to rise up, to speak up, to be brave, be bold, be the change you wish to see in the world. You are never alone. Sending you all my deepest love, so much light, and wishing you all a beautiful rest of the night. Thank you so much for joining me, Stephanie Lucretio, Wellness Warriors Revolution, with Rabbi David Smith saying, have a beautiful evening, and God bless you all. Amen. God bless you all, too.